Do you remember those Linus Tech Tips videos where he would go to famous YouTubers' houses, ask them how they store their backups, and it turns out they had a bunch of external drives? Yeah, that's me. I'm that YouTuber. I mean, at first, things were alright. I bought a 1TB drive, and that was supposed to store everything. But with me now rendering my videos in 4K, I quickly ran out of storage, so I bought a second drive. With what a pain it is to have separate files on separate drives, I have now found my second hard drive being full, and now my first hard drive still has a few hundred gigabytes left. I mean, I'm not splitting my YouTube stuff between two drives, no chance. So I need to consolidate everything into one. And that's where this bad boy comes in. It's an 8TB Seagate desktop drive. It's pretty unremarkable, but it was relatively cheap at £130, which comes out to roughly £16 per terabyte, pretty much half of what it costs to buy a 1TB external drive. That's my justification for the purchase anyway. My second justification is that it was sold on an Amazon Spring Sale by Amazon directly, and has a two-year warranty. As my 1TB Seagate drive from Curry's turned out to have been taken out of a multi-product bundle, and I never actually had any warranty on it. A video on an external hard drive is unexciting at best, but that's not the only upgrade today. I wanted to own a media server for years now, so I can access my over 100 gigabytes of music or my Blu-ray rips, whether in the house or outside of it. I used my old HP laptop as a server before, but that drew a lot of power, and the fan constantly coming on and off at full speed was irritating, and I'd even dared to use it for streaming video to my other devices, it was just too old and slow for that. My initial plan was to snag a job lot Optiplex mini tower, and drop in two 4TB drives for redundancy. However, from what I could see, Optiplexes only have one 3.5 inch drive tray. So I went with another route. Sticking with Amazon sale offers, I found this mini PC on Amazon. This is the T9 Plus. At just over £100, it's a fantastic value. With a 12th gen Intel N95, whatever that is, 8GB of RAM, and a 256GB SATA SSD boot drive. Actually, those specs match up more closely with the T8 Plus, though as you can see, the T8 Plus has a different case. It also has three USB 3.1 ports, three HDMI ports capable of 4K 60Hz output, and two Ethernet jacks. I wanted to not rely on Windows for this server, especially since I didn't need any Windows applications on it. Plex and RetroArch have native Linux clients. So I went with PopOS. Yes, RetroArch. I wanted to see how this mini PC fares at being an emulation machine. And oh boy was I disappointed. PS2 could only run at 2x render resolution, which is 720p. On Windows, DX11 worked the best instead. PS1 at least could run at 1080p, though at 4K I was getting choppy audio. On Linux, I was not able to get the CRT filters to run at a good frame rate, though I was having no problem like this on Windows. Likewise, I tried Dreamcast simulation, and Crazy Taxi was choking on Linux, but perfectly fine on Windows, even with 1080p render resolution. The computer is really fast to boot up, taking 12 seconds from BIOS to Pop OS on a clean install, though on Windows we are looking at more around the 30 second mark. Going back to speaking about the hardware for a quick second, the Realtek Wi-Fi chip inside is Wi-Fi 6 capable, and we do have Bluetooth on board too. The headphone jack is handled by an internal USB audio DAC, interestingly enough. The RGB lights are handled by an internal serial to USB adapter. Supposedly the system came with an app to control the LEDs, but I couldn't find it on the install of Windows 11. I reckon it was deleted by Windows Defender, since people have reported for it to show up as a virus. The only thing I could find were strange empty folders, and a WPS Office installer. Of course, it's always best to reinstall Windows on devices like this anyway. Though if you are, like I end up doing, beware there are no pre-installed Wi-Fi drivers. In fact, Windows Update does not even pick up the Wi-Fi card at all, and I ended up having to rely on Snappy to grab the driver. So with me wanting to use Linux, why did I eventually go back to Windows? Well, because for the life of me, I could not figure out how to do a Samba share, as I also wanted to use this server as a NAS. I ended up removing my own rights to, the re to read and write the drive, so I just gave up. So how does this mini PC perform as a NAS? Well, Wi-Fi was an immediate no-go speed-wise, so I hardwired the mini PC. Having my laptop next to the router, on Wi-Fi, I was getting about 111 megabytes a second write. About 80 megabytes a second off from the maximum speed I was getting locally. Upstairs I'm getting an average of 30 megabytes a second write, so about 160 megabytes off local. It's not the best, definitely. But the whole joy of having a NAS is being able to double click on my desktop icon and offload my files, without having to go through my drawers, grab a hard drive, wait for it to spin up, and then drop my files onto it. And then when the hard drive is plugged in, I cannot walk around my laptop, no, without spinning the drive down first. Here, I feel like I have the freedom to work anywhere in the house, and possibly even outside the house, but I'm not going that far with this NAS. In terms of redundancy, well, I'm going to occasionally plug in the external drives and copy over new files onto them. That should work until I fill up the drives. In terms of power draw, using a highly unscientific method of looking at my smart meter, the mini PC uses around 10 watts of power, and the hard drive uses about five. Regardless of accuracy, that's around 24 pence a day it costs to run the computer anyway. If I'm doing the maths right, that's £87 a year. 
drop the usage down to when I'm at home and not asleep, that brings it down to £19 a year. I'm happy with that. Last thing I will say is that Windows does perform poorer than Pop OS on the desktop. Moving Windows around causes the CPU to go into high utilization, and the animations weren't all that smooth at 4K on Windows. I was having a glitch with extremely slow write speeds on the machine, though a restart did fix it, and it caused the write speeds to shoot up. I was only getting around 120 megabytes a second on Linux, though on Windows it does go up to the aforementioned 190, which is oddly fast for a hard drive. So how was the Plex performance? Perfect really. I was able to stream 4K HDR videos with surround sound onto my Apple TV with no problem, no hitching whatsoever. Frankly, I was expecting having to do hardware transcoding for the Apple TV, but thankfully it seems perfectly happy with whatever files Plex throws at it. Oh and by the way, if you want a nice way to remotely turn the PC on and off, Unified Remote is the way to go. So that's that then. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you for the next video.